Today I want to share with you how to make a turkey neck pot au feu. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough and more. So if you enjoy learning how to be a modern pioneer in the kitchen, consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to click on the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I upload a new video. If at any time you want to jump ahead in this video, just check the description or the pinned comment where I'll have detailed timestamps. Plus, I'll also have a link there that'll take you over to my website, Mary's Nest, same name as my YouTube channel, where there'll be a printable recipe. Well, if you're French, the first thing I have to say is please excuse me if my pronunciation of pot au feu is not 100% correct, but I have to tell you that I watch a charming French gentleman on YouTube who teaches Americans and other English speakers how to properly pronounce French words, but he's very entertaining because he will say the word multiple times so that you can practice, but then he's very cute because he says, Alrighty, but if you're speaking English, you can just say pot of pho. <laughs> Makes me laugh. But in any event, I believe I'm fairly close to what he's teaching, and I think it's pot of pho. So, but if I'm off, just put it phonetically for me in the comments. Well, what I understand is that technically pot of pho translates to pot on fire, but what it actually is, is a very delicious sort of soup stew type dish. And it's quintessentially French and is traditionally made with cuts of tough beef that are going to be simmered. So they're going to become very tender and they often have some cartilage on them, which helps make the broth very rich, very gelatinous. And if you've ever made bone broth with me, you know how important it is that we eat or drink soups and stews that do have gelatinous properties to them. Now, it's not like gelatin when it's heated up. You can't tell the difference. But if you chilled it in your fridge, yes, it would gel. And why do we want foods like that in our diet? Because they're very nourishing to our digestive system, as well as our hair, our skin, our nails. It's just an overall wonderful food for good health. But a while back, I was watching the very famous chef and cookbook author Jacques Pepin, and he made a pot au feu with turkey necks. And I said, oh my goodness, this is the perfect recipe for somebody like me. It's very reasonable to make, and turkey necks are loaded with cartilage, which are rich in collagen, which when cooked slowly are going to melt down and create gelatin, thereby creating a gelatinous broth. But more importantly, if you've ever eaten the meat off of a turkey neck or even a chicken neck, you can use chicken necks to make this as well. It's very tasty. You will be surprised how tasty the meat from the neck of poultry is. So I highly recommend if at Thanksgiving, you only even have one turkey neck, you try this recipe. But the good news is that often around Thanksgiving here in the United States, you can often buy turkey necks in bulk in a package of maybe three or more. And you can even ask your butcher and he will be very happy if you tell him you'd like to buy turkey necks because often those are not high on people's shopping lists, but they should be. Now, if you wind up with just one turkey neck, but you also have the giblets, like maybe the heart, and the gizzard, you can put that into your pot au feu. Uh, Jack Pepin sh uh, shares that he will make this with gizzards, with the hearts, with the turkey necks, with chicken necks, with the carcass, you know, and let the meat sort of fall off and into the broth. So this is a very versatile recipe that you can have more or less in your recipe file to make use of various vegetables in your crisper, as well as various like little bits and bobs of, of giblets or necks or a carcass, or maybe say wing tips, whatever you have on hand. And you'll be able to make a nice rich broth, plus have lots of good vegetables to go along with it. And pot au feu is served in a beautiful way 
which I will share with you once we cook this. Now let's go over all the ingredients that you're going to need to make this turkey neck pot au feu. And first and foremost is the star of the show, the turkey necks. And I have six turkey necks here. So this will feed uh, four to six people. Next, you're going to want a leek. I have two here. I'm probably just gonna use one uh, because I'm gonna make this more or less to serve four. And then I've got four potatoes here. I just have the thin skinned ones, uh, the red potatoes. I'm not gonna peel them. Uh, depending on what type of potato you have, if you have the heavier skinned baking potatoes, you probably want to give them a peel. Uh, also, I've got some carrots here. I've got four carrots, because as I said, I am going to make this uh, for four, and I've got four potatoes. I've got some celery here, and I'm going to, yeah, I'll show you how I prepare the celery. I like everything to kind of be able to stay together, so I am going to leave the root on that, and I'm just going to cut it into fours. So as I said, I've got the carrots here. I've got, for the herbs, I've got a bunch of thyme and two bay leaves, and I'm going to tie this up with some kitchen twine that I've got over here. And then I've got an onion. I'll just quarter this. I've got some cabbage, I'll do the same. I'll quarter this. And then I've got a turnip, I'm gonna peel this. I'm just gonna throw this in whole. And then uh, when I go to serve it uh, to the individual portions, I can uh, just cut that turnip in half. But I'm kind of cooking everything more or less like the potatoes and the turnip whole so they don't disintegrate too much. And the only other ingredient that you're gonna need is some salt. Certainly you could add black pepper or red pepper flakes if you want a little bit of a kick to it, but I'm just gonna use salt today. Now, not 100% required, but if you have a nice baguette and some Gruyere cheese on hand, that will be perfect. And I'll show you how we'll use it when we prepare the meal to serve. Now I'm gonna take these turkey necks and I'm gonna cut them best I can into thirds. A job like this works relatively well. I'm not super strong, but it works relatively well if you have a heavy cleaver like this. If not, a really good sharp knife will work great too. So let's give this a try. There we go. Alrighty, we got our first piece done. And if when you look at it, you say, okay, this is good enough, you can certainly just do two pieces. And if this task seems intimidating, know that you can ask your butcher to help you out. Now, the reason that I'm cutting these necks into three pieces is because these are eaten with your hands. They're in essence a finger food because you're going to be picking them up like you would say a spare rib and eating the meat off of the turkey neck. So I like to cut them into sizes that are easy to hold. And not just easy to hold, but easy to, even as Jacques Pepin says, to sort of be able to suck the meat out of the inside of the turkey neck. Alrighty, now let me see if I have enough strength to get this into thirds. Here we go. Or I mean, I'd like to cut this one last piece in half so I have three pieces. Okay, there we go. That's good. <laughs> Already now I'm going to go ahead and cut up the rest of these turkey necks. And if you notice, I mean, I may not have as much strength as you do. You may have more strength than me and you may be able to get it with one good whack. But since it does take me a little longer, I'll go ahead and just cut these up and then I'll bring you back once I have them all cut up. All the tough work is done. Everything from here on in is downhill. Very easy. <laughs> the first thing we're going to do is take a, our cut turkey necks and we're just gonna go ahead and put them in a nice big stock pot. Uh, even if you have like a large Dutch oven, that'll work great too. You just need something that can hold all of your turkey necks. You may, you may have less or more than me and whatever vegetables you wanna add in uh, plus sufficient water to cover. Well, I've got the turkey necks in the stock pot and I just wanted to mention, because I get a lot of questions about it, whenever I use this bowl with the pretty hobnail pattern along the rim, this is actually not technically a bowl. It's actually part of a punch bowl set. And if I can find this online, I don't, this belonged to my mom. 
I don't know how old it is or who made it. Maybe it was maybe Libby or Anchor Hawking, you know, one of those. And if I find it, I'll put a link below. Uh, but just know that it, it's like with a punch bowl set. And the cooktop, this little portable cooktop, I always get a lot of questions about this. It's a Cuisinart. It is still available, and I will put a link in the description below. It's terrific. I really find it works well. Uh, just know that it does run hot, so the first time you use it, if you're thinking you want to bring something up to a boil, don't worry, you don't have to crank it up to five. It'll heat pretty quickly on even like a three or a four, so you just want to be aware of that. Now I'm going to go ahead and throw in two bay leaves. These are dried bay leaves. I often get questions, can you use dried bay leaves? And yes, that's what I'm using. They just, the ones I have are very green, but they are dried. So I'm going to go ahead and add those. And now I'm just going to take a little bit of kitchen twine and tie up my bunch of thyme. Really any amount you want if you want. Just I like thyme. If you just want a couple of sprigs, that's fine. Uh, but I've just got a little bunch here. And I'm going to tie this up because we'll fish this out uh, before we serve it. Just make a little nice, a little bow here. It's technically, I was going to say bouquet garni, but technically it's, I, I don't think it is because I think that's when you have a bunch. Uh, this one's kind of loose, but when you have a bunch that, uh, a bunch of herbs tied together. But the leaves, as this is simmering, this one's like the hanging off, the leaves uh, at, will start to come off into the broth, which is nice. And if any leaves are left, when you fish out your thyme, you can, if there's still a lot of leaves on and you want them in your broth, you can just let it cool a little and then you can just pull them off. They'll come off very easily. So I'm going to go ahead and drop that into the pot as well. Well, I've got my bay leaf and my thyme in there, my turkey necks. Now I'm going to go ahead and add in about three quarts of water for this amount of turkey necks. Now I don't think this pitcher holds a full three quarts, so I'll go get some more water. But that's basically, for this amount, uh, you want three quarts. And if you're using like different amounts and all, don't worry. All you want to make sure is that you're covered your bones, uh, whatever you're using, whether it's turkey necks or chicken necks, and even if you're using any kind of gizzards and things like that, uh, the various giblets, but not the liver. You always want to keep the liver out because that would make everything kind of cloudy. Better to cook the liver on the side and just enjoy it as a cook's treat. But uh, you want to just make sure everything's covered by about an inch or two of water. Now I'm just going to bring this up to a boil. Once it's up to a boil, I'll turn it down uh, to just a medium heat and let it simmer for about 45 minutes. Now while we're waiting for that to come up to a boil and then simmer for 45 minutes on medium, I'll go ahead and prep the vegetables. Because after 45 minutes of simmering, we're going to go ahead and add in our veggies, bring everything back up to a boil, then turn it down to a medium simmer and let it simmer for an additional 30 minutes. And at that point, everything should be cooked and we should be ready to eat. I like to peel my carrots, but that's completely up to you. If you want, you can certainly leave the skin on. But if you do peel them, don't throw away these peelings. Just add these to your scrap bag because these are perfect for the next time you make a bone broth. And I will be sure to link in the description below and in the pinned comment, whichever is easiest for you to access. Uh, a link to my playlist where I make bone broth, all types of bone broth. And it's a very extensive playlist, so if that's something that you're interested in, be sure to check the information below. Now I like to cut off both the end and the tip of the carrot. And again, I don't throw it out, it goes right into the scrap bag uh, for my next bone broth or vegetable broth. I think I've got two sort of super mineral broths on my channel here on YouTube. And you can use scraps to make those as well. These are loaded with nutrition. Now I just want to mention when this does come up to a boil, I'm going to add a teaspoon of salt and give it a good stir. I don't like to put the salt in now uh, with it not at least simmering or boiling because I don't want it to cause any pitting inside of my pot, inside of my soup pot here. 
So that's something to keep in mind. Next, okay, so we've got the carrots all cleaned up. Uh, now I'm going to just peel the onion. I'm not going to throw the skin away. Uh, that again, you know, if you've been with me for a while, you know that I always tell you to save these things. They contain nutrition, so there's nothing to uh, discard. Now, but what I'm going to do is some of these veggies, I will, like the turnip and the onion, I'm going to keep whole. And then when it's time to serve, you know, we can just pull off uh, some of the onion uh, to enjoy with our meal. But I'm not going to cut it up. Things tend to, when you make dishes like this, if you put things in too small, they do tend to disintegrate. This outer part of the onion, this for I guess I should say the skin is the outer part, this layer, it's a little, sometimes, you know, things just, uh, they're just like a little, they feel a little, little I don't want to say mushy, but I just think that even once it's cooked, it's not going to be too, the lower part is okay, but the upper part, uh, I think would cook up a little funny. It might be a little rubbery. That sometimes happens when I'm roasting a chicken and I don't take off that first uh, layer. It sometimes is not too uh, appetizing. But I'm just going to go ahead. I'm going to keep the onion whole. I'm going to put it right in like that. But even if these little bits and bobs of onion don't seem perfect, I don't worry about it because they are perfect for your scrap bag uh, because they have nutrition and they're wonderful to add into any of your broths, whether they're bone broths or vegetable broths. Already now, I'm gonna go ahead and peel the turnip and I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm just gonna put it in whole and then we can just break off pieces when we're ready to eat. Now turnips can be a little strong in terms of their scraps. So I'm actually gonna put these in a separate scrap bag that I would reserve just for a vegetable broth where I don't mind having that turnip flavor in. Uh, it works perfectly in the pot au feu, <laughs> but for a bone broth, I generally don't add in my turnip scraps. So these will go in their own uh, scrap bag with some other vegetable scraps that I tend not to add into bone broth. Now we don't need this entire bunch of celery, but I want the root end because I'm going to divide this into fours, but I'm hoping that I can keep it together as much as possible. And so I'm just going to cut it crosswise and I'm going to save this for another recipe. So celery tends to be very dirty. So once I cut this into quarters, then I'm going to give, go ahead and give it a really good rinse. So let's see if I can keep this together as much as possible. I like to do this so that when you go to serve it, you're just kind of giving a quarter of the celery to each uh, person enjoying your meal. I do this also like when I make corned beef and cabbage and you'll see how I keep the cabbage together too. I keep the core intact because it's nice to be able to give someone a nice wedge of cabbage as opposed to just a lot of little pieces of cabbage. That's just me. You can certainly do it any way you want. And we'll add in all these little bits as well. But I'm going to go ahead and bring these over to my sink and give them a good wash. You might hear my cooktop ticking as it's coming up to a boil. So that's what that noise is. Now I wanted the celery's nice and clean and now I want to go and show you how I cut up this cabbage. You'll see the core is right here and I'm just going to do my best very carefully because I'm working with something that's kind of ro rocking. <laughs> and I, but I want to cut it this way so I can see what I'm doing in terms of keeping the core intact. It gets a little easier once you get through that. Alrighty, so now see, now some pieces are going to come off, you can't help that, but at least we've got the core intact. So then what I'm going to do is take this and cut it right down the center of that halved core. And that will help keep this cabbage quarter together as much as possible. 
it's not perfect. It's not a perfect science. And you'll see some of the leaves are going to come off, but we'll just go ahead and throw those in. But pretty good. Now I'm going to do the same thing with the leek. I'm just going to use one leek and I'm going to cut this in the same way I cut the celery. And then like the celery, leeks too are very dirty. Uh, but once I quarter this, it's going to be a lot easier to wash. Now I am going to leave on some of the greens, but so that I can kind of fit it comfortably in my pot, I'm just going to cut a little bit off the top here. But again, I know you're not going to be surprised by what I'm going to say. Don't throw out anything that you cut off of your leek. Granted, I could put the whole thing in, especially once it's quartered, it'll soften pretty quickly. But I am just, just to neaten things up a little bit. And so they make a lovely presentation. Uh, when we go to serve it. I am going to just clean this up. Now, you've got options for this. You can put this in your scrap bag. It'll give a wonderful oniony type flavor to any type of broth you make. You can also, and I'll be sure to put this link below, uh, try the spaghetti recipe uh, that I share with you where I actually slice these uh, saute them in some olive oil. I may use garlic, I can't remember exactly, and just some salt and pepper, maybe some red pepper flakes, and then toss the whole thing with spaghetti. And the, these are shorter because I'm just cleaning up the leek, but normally if you're cutting, if you're just using the white and the light green part of your leek, and you're cutting off the entire greens, you can then cut these thinly into a length that's going to be re relatively close to your spaghetti. So you have your spaghetti and then uh, all these lovely greens with this wonderful onion flavor uh, tossed in with your spaghetti and it's really delicious. I remember the very first time I made it, my husband and I inhaled it. We really enjoyed it. So you do have options and I'll be sure to put that, I mean, I can't even really call it a recipe because it's such a simple little thing to make, but I will definitely uh, put a link to that below. Also too, I don't know if you've seen my previous video where I shared with you how to make a traditional French pumpkin soup. That soup requires leeks. And so I say the same thing, you know, don't throw out those leek greens. You may think, oh my gosh, they're tough and what are they going to taste like? Once you saute them in olive oil and you cut them into thin strips and you saute them in olive oil, they are delicious and they're great with the spaghetti. Alrighty, so what we're going to do is just, again, we're just going to quarter this. So the first step was just basically cutting this leek in half. Now I'm going to cut each half into half so that I've got uh, the four quarters. And I just basically just gently, gingerly sort of work my way down, keeping the root intact because I want to try to, I'd like to serve this with everything kind of intact. Like the carrots, I'm going to just put those, I'm not going to chop them into pieces. I just think it looks so nice on the platter where you have all these veggies uh, somewhat whole and then each person can either take, take a piece off, uh, you know, cut a, bake a little piece off, or they can take the whole carrot. Alrighty, so now, as you'll see, see, isn't that pretty? And it, it stays intact. So per, someone who really enjoys leeks can either take the whole thing or break off a piece, whatever they want. Now, this also makes them very easy to wash. So I'll go and do that in a minute. Let me just continue just working my way through cutting this final one in half. And then we'll take it over to the sink and give it a good wash. See, you'll see, I'll show you, see how dirty? They just are, they're very, very dirty. And so you have to be careful because you don't want any, see, this is a good example here. You don't want that in your broth and, you know, it's not only is it dirt, it's also gritty. So you want to make sure that any vegetables that you're using that uh, tend to uh, be grown in a way where they do accumulate a lot of dirt or sand, you want to make sure you give them a good wash. Well, this is getting close to coming up to a boil. Once it does, we'll turn it down and let it simmer. We've got all of our vegetables ready. Uh, so once this is simmering for 45 minutes, it's great because the stovetop's doing all the work and we can do something else, uh, another kitchen task, whatever the case may be. 
But I just wanted to share with you, I love meals like this, because to me, this is such wonderful home cooking. And that's really why Jacques Pepin is one of my favorite uh, chefs to follow, both on television as well as in his cookbooks. Uh, even though he is a famous chef and a professionally trained chef, he does a lot of things that are uh, just lovely forms of home cooking and making use of everything and not wasting. And he often shares stories about how uh, this was how his mother cooked and things he learned from his mother. And sometimes he'll make something uh, that was something his mother made and taught him how to make or he observed her making. And he'll often say at the end, oh, I think my mother would be proud. And I find that so sweet. And when I was blessed to be able to write a book, The Modern Pioneer Cookbook, I was also able to share a lot of stories in that book about my mom and about how she taught me how to cook and how she never wasted anything, you know, and she taught me never to waste. Uh, she grew up during the Great Depression of the 1930s and the rationing and shortages of World War II and so on and so forth, both her and my dad. And she could literally make a meal out of scraps. And I, that's what I think is so sweet uh, about Jacques Pepin's stories because I feel that his mother and my mother would have gotten along very well. And, and I like to think that maybe we as uh, young children and uh, young adults were uh, very much influenced by our moms. I mean, I can't hold a candle to Jacques Pepin, but just as a home cook, that we were influenced by our moms to make use of everything in our kitchen. And I think that a meal like this, it's just home cooking, it's delicious, it's nourishing, uh, which is also very important. It's not just about cooking any old thing, it's about cooking things that also nourish us. And often it's the simplest foods that nourish us. And so I hope that you'll really embrace home cooking and look at every little scrap you have in a new light and think, how can, how can I turn this into something? What can I do with this? How can I make a meal from it? My mother was a master of making meals from scraps. And I share a lot of recipes here on Mary's Nest as to how to make meals with scraps. And I'll be sure to link, I, have, I think I pretty much have everything in a playlist and I'll be sure to link to that below. And I hope that you'll enjoy that. And I, I hope that it helps inspire you uh, to also uh, learn how to waste as little as possible. I realize a no waste kitchen is, is it's not always possible, but uh, we can definitely create low waste kitchens and make the most of every little bit of food that we have, especially today. Food is expensive, and so we want to learn how to make meals uh, with pretty much everything that goes into our fridge, goes into our freezer, or goes into our pantries. And whether they're clean out the crisper soups or clean out the fridge, meals, whatever the case may be. My son is very cute because he's a grown man now, but he'll say, oh, mom, I always loved those clean out the fridge and clean out the freezer meals you would make. And that makes me very happy that he remembers that, where I would just find little bits and bobs of this, that, and the other thing, and I'd put it, put it all into a slow cooker, maybe add a can of tomatoes or something, and we'd all eat a hearty meal. You know, you can have a little homemade bread. It doesn't even need to be sourdough. You know, whatever type of bread is easiest for you to make, even a quick bread. And, you know, that's what I talk about in my cookbook. It's because it's so important to me. I never want people to be overwhelmed. So I, every chapter, I start with something very simple, like a quick bread. And then we graduate up to a sandwich bread. But we're making it with yeast from the grocery store, the packaged yeast. And only then, after we master the quick bread and sandwich bread, do we move on to talking about making a sourdough starter and making sourdough bread. And so every chapter is a journey. And, you know, as I always say, thank you for being on this journey with me, on this traditional foods journey, because it is a journey. It's not something you need to do overnight. You, you need to do this little by little and only do that which with, with which you are comfortable. 
not trying to say, well, I'm just going to make everything. No, you make that which you like, that which you enjoy, that which fits into your schedule, just, as, just so that as you are on this journey, you're making more and more homemade. And when you make more homemade, you actually find that often the cooktop or the slow cooker or the oven is doing a lot of the work for you. And you also find that you suddenly have more um, disposable income in your grocery budget. Maybe to upgrade and buy a little better chicken or you know, maybe buy some pastured eggs. It, you don't have to start like that in the beginning. I never say that. You buy any chicken that fits in your budget. But over time, as you start to make things more homemade and, you, and you're buying less processed food, less packaged food, which often is very costly, you find that, oh, I was able to make that homemade, or oh, I didn't need to buy mayonnaise, especially mayonnaise. So many are made with processed oils today. And when you make them homemade, you can make them with nutritious, nourishing oils, and it costs you less than what you would pay if you bought the prepared mayonnaise. So all these little things, and when you start making homemade bread, and when you start making homemade soups instead of uh, buying them, and especially bone broth, Oh my goodness, bone broth has become so expensive. Uh, but and even, unfortunately, even the beef both bones are sometimes expensive. But as I share with you, you can just use the carcass of your roast chicken and make a nice, and look at today, we're using turkey necks. And this is gonna be a very nourishing uh, broth that we're gonna be able to enjoy along with all of the wonderful vegetables that we're gonna be able to eat. So that's the wonderful thing about becoming a home cook. And I'm sorry, I, I, get, I guess I can wax poetic about this because I feel so passionate about it. But uh, starting your journey, if you're at the beginning of your journey as a home cook, I really want to encourage you and cheer you on. And I'm so happy uh, that you are joining us on this traditional foods journey because I think you're going to find it very rewarding and it's something that you're going to want to continue throughout your life and you're going to want to teach others, whether it's your children, other family members, or your friends, because there's nothing like becoming a home cook and being able to nourish people uh, with food that you made with your own hands. Well, our turkey necks have come up to a boil, so now I'm just gonna go ahead and sprinkle a little salt in here, about a teaspoon or so. You know, again, it's not an exact science. We'll taste it at the very end to see any additional seasoning that we want to add in. And I'm just going to give that a stir just to help that salt dissolve. And then I'm going to put the lid on and we'll just turn this down to about a medium simmer. Well, this has simmered for 45 minutes and the turkey necks look terrific. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna add in all of our veggies and then we're just gonna bring this up to a boil and put in the turnip, I got the onion there, I got the potatoes. <laughs> Doing it gingerly, it's hot. <laughs> And then I'll go ahead and put the carrots in, and then I'll put the celery in. It's all, basically a lot of the veggies, I'm putting the uh, denser ones on the bottom, and then I'll finish it all off with the cabbage on top. Because in essence, you're, you're kind of braising in many ways the vegetables. A lot of the, the, the broth is coming up to cover much of the vegetables, but also the ones on the very top are more or less getting, you know, braised or in a sense, almost like steamed. Let's see if we're gonna be able to get all this in here. And then I'll put that cabbage on top and then we'll bring this up to a boil. Then we'll turn it down. Once it comes up to a boil, then we'll turn it down to a simmer. We'll put the cabbage right on top. What I like, this is exactly in many ways how I got extra bees here. Uh, how I do um, corned beef and cabbage. I've got a number of recipes uh, for that, so you can kind of tuck those in the back of your mind for uh, St. Patrick's Day. What's interesting is 
that I always like to put the cabbage on top. And so it cooks, but it's, it stays intact also too because I leave the core in. And what's nice is it still has some texture, some body to it. So already I've got everything in there. Now we'll bring this up to a boil. And once it comes up to a boil, turn it down to a simmer. And then I'll go ahead and put the lid back on. Well, I let this simmer for 30 minutes and it looks perfect. I turned the heat off. I used my knife to check the cabbage. The texture is perfect. It's beautifully cooked. So we are ready to enjoy this. Now, traditionally, when a dish like this is served, the broth can be served first as a soup or side by side with the main part of the dish, the meat, the vegetables, so on and so forth. And the soup or the broth is generally served in a very nice way. And I wanted to show you how to prepare it. Given that we're in the fall and the Thanksgiving season, I have these very cute little soup bowls that I, I'm just a sucker for this sort of stuff. And I have to show you, I'm just gonna move these uh, baguette slices, but this is a dish that my sweet father-in-law, Tom, gave to me. He's since passed away, but the, I love having the plate. He knew that I was a sucker for these kind of holiday things. But in any event, uh, I know that he's looking down from heaven and happy to see you know, that I'm using it. But what I'm gonna do is just take out some of the broth. I may actually start just plating up some of the veggies to give myself a little room so that I can put some broth in here and I'll show you how we'll prepare it. And I just wanna show you, see the, the cabbage, it's tender and cooked, but it all stays together because we kept the core in place. I'll, I'll bring the serving plate uh, forward to show you how everything looks once I get all the meat uh, plated up on it, but I just want to show you how to, I just needed to make a little room so I could get some of the broth out. Oh gosh, it looks so good. Now, I'm not going to add any additional salt because you'll see what we're going to do with this lovely brothy soup. And in terms of the food, oops, sorry. <laughs> I like to let everybody Pre, uh, add their own seasoning at the table because we do have that one teaspoon of salt. Well, okay, I've got some broth in the bowl and now what you can do is take, you know, like one or two sliced baguette and I've toasted these so they're nice and crisp and then you can just place them on top of your soup floating, sort of like a French onion soup. Then I've got some grated Gruyere and I'll go ahead and just sprinkle that right on top of the croutons and just the heat. Now, I've had, I didn't just take my baguettes out of the toaster oven, so they've cooled off a little, oh, they're still a little warm. But uh, if you've just taken them out of the toaster, that will help the cheese melt. And also, just the heat of the broth is going to help some of the cheese melt. But if you have soup bowls that have little lids like this, you can put the lid on, that'll help it melt. And then also people will get a surprise when they open it at the dinner table. Now the reason I wasn't adding any extra salt to the broth was because putting the Gruyere cheese on top of the croutons and it's gonna melt a little bit into the soup, uh, is that's a salty cheese. And so I didn't want to add too much salt, but I'll give it a little taste and I'll tell you how it is. Mmm. Oh, that's delicious. Oh, it has a wonderful turkey flavor to it. And just a little bit of the, you pick up a little bit of the thyme and the bay leaves. Oh, it's very pleasant. And I'm glad I didn't add any extra salt because that teaspoon of salt we added in the beginning when the turkey necks we're simmering was sufficient. It's, I think it's very well seasoned. So that would be like your first course, or you could serve it beside your plate uh, in which you're, you're going to have everything else that's in this pot. Now we're gonna take everything out and I'll show you how nice this is gonna plate up. And then I'll show you when you go to serve this, uh, I like to serve things like this in a large uh, bowl, but an, it, an individual serving bowl, but a large bowl. And 
that way people can have a little bit of everything uh, in their bowl along with their turkey necks. Boy, this smells so good. So here are the leeks. Now you'll see that even though we put the roots, we, we, or we kept the roots on, they did stay together, but they're very softened. So it's very easy for people to just take a little bit if that's all they want. And see how softened that is. This is gonna be so tasty. And here we see, there's some celery. And then as I fish everything out, then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll bring you back once I get everything out. But I just want to show you, look at, oh, the carrots are very tender. Oh, we've got the potatoes. Yeah, I like to leave the potatoes whole. They're, oops. <laughs> they're, they're cooked, they're tender, um, but they're intact. And here's some more celery. I love it in these big pieces like this. I just feel it's so, as my Italian mother would say, abudanza. It's, it looks abundant. And I like that. And I, I love these. I mean, I think so many cultures have these. Uh, growing up on the East Coast, we had something called like a, a New England boiled dinner. And it reminds me a lot of this. Here's the turnip. Oh, yes, it's... Ah! <laughs> and so people can just break off, you know, some of that. And here's the onion, very tender. More potatoes. Oh, look at how, it's just so lovely. There's so much food. That's what's so great about this. You know, I said you, you feed four to six and there's plenty here. And it's healthy, you know, it's a healthy amount of food here. I definitely think you can have some leftovers. Here are the turkey necks coming out and we will taste them. I'll show you how the meat looks when you pull it off. Boy, this broth is just gonna be amazing. And I'm confident because we use turkey necks, even though it was a shorter than, you know, shorter amount of time simmering it than what uh, would be, you know, when you make an official bone broth. But I'm confident this, when this chills, if there's any left, <laughs> it's going to be g quite gelatinous. And I just think this meat is gonna be tremendously tasty. Oh, here we'll fish out our herbs. Alrighty, then to plate this up, what I like to do is take a, a nice quarter of the cabbage. And you could even slice up this cabbage, you know, we've got the four here because I'm only planning on feeding four. But, you know, if you were doing this for six, it's easy enough to, to break. I mean, it's tender enough, you know, with a knife. We'll put in some carrots, we'll get a potato, We'll get some of this onion. We'll get some of the leeks. Ooh, <laughs> they're always very tasty leeks. And we'll get some of this celery. And what else? Oh, and some of the turnip. See, it's just slices beautifully. I'll put that near the potato. My grandmother always liked mixing turnips and potato together. Now we'll put in the star of the show, some of the turkey necks. And then what you can do, if you want, this is a hearty meal. You can also just put in like, you know, just a little bit of broth just to kind of moisten everything up. This is going to be lovely. I mean, you bring a meal like this to the table. I don't think anybody's going home hungry. <laughs> now, as I shared with you, this, I mean, it just falls right off the bone. Look at this. See? The meat, it's just falling right off the bone. This reminds me, doing this with the turkey necks, this reminds me a lot of like when you do oxtails and then the meat is just so tender, falling off the bone. Well, let's give this a taste. Mmm. Such a beautiful flavor of turkey. You're gonna really enjoy this. I hope you'll give this a try. Now, if you'd like more recipes for your Thanksgiving celebrations, be sure to click on this video over here where I have a full playlist from turkey to cranberry sauce, mashed potatoes, the works. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love, God bless, and happy Thanksgiving.